Welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk as we do the next program in Search of Christianity. And what a search it has been. Amen. Uh, on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, I want to greet you and welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're glad that you can be with us even though it's only digitally. Yes. If you'd like it to be a little more than digitally, you're welcome to go on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash in search of Christianity where you can join in on the conversation, add your comments and questions, and just play along with us here, hallelujah, in the joy of God's Word. Amen. Uh, in, our, in our last program, we talked about, I actually did a little study of the entire Bible and the history of man from beginning to end. And all of that was, as I said at the time, a preparation for our study of Babylon. And that's what we're going to get into now, is looking at the kingdom of Babylon, as it was in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, as it, time, as it will be in the end of time. Oh, but yeah. before we do that, once again, as, as our norm, Mark is going to ask God's blessing upon this study. There's a verse in Hosea, I will ransom thee from the power of Sheol, I will redeem them from death. Oh, Lord, we are just thankful that you did both of those yes. through your Son, Jesus Christ. And this is a study of, of that and so much more. And we just thank you for his, kind of, his uh, coming then and his coming now to this Bible study. Amen. Amen. Yes, we thank you for your always faithful presence, yes, Lord. Lord. All right. So, um, as I say, we're going to look at Babylon. Now, you have to go back. Remember, Jesus said when the return of the Lord will be like in the times of Noah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the time of Noah, when God destroyed the earth and mankind because of the sin, because of the violence, it says, right? Mm -hmm. That he saved <clears throat> Noah and his family. Noah, his wife, his children, and their spouses. Yes. Uh, Noah had three sons at the time, mm -hmm. and after the waters had receded, what happens is you see the Bible talks about in Genesis, kind of chapter 9, 10, and 11, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, what did I get up into Nimrod here already? Mm -hmm. That Noah had the sons were Ham, whose son was Cush, whose son was Nimrod. And Nimrod becomes the founder of what is the first city become empire after the flood. And that is Babylon. Right? Now, it, this, this happened, it took place, and this is important, as you'll see later on, in the plains of Shinar. But before I do that, I want to talk about this. Because you see, there's something, there's something that we need to take note of when it comes to his three sons. Ham was the one son of Noah who dishonored his father. Mm -hmm. All right? And because of that, Noah actually placed a curse on Ham. And I, actually, the curse was on, on his son, Canaan. Okay. But you know, if you followed our Bible studies or you'd studied the word, that the Bible talks about the sins of the father are visited upon the children, generation after generation. And the only way to break that generational curse is to change fathers. Absolutely. Which is why we have to be born again and be born of our Father in Heaven rather than our natural Father, right? Can I <coughs> excuse me? Ask you. Um, you said the three sons were Shem, Shem and Ham, and Japheth. Japheth. Yeah. Japheth. Okay. And was Nimrod? Where did he come? No, no. From from Ham. Oh. Ham is a son who dishonored his father. Now right. that's an important fact that's here, right? right? Yes. And. Uh, Ham gives birth to Cush. Cush gives birth to Nimrod. Oh, okay. Okay? okay. So Nimrod, that mighty hunter, which by the way is not, this is not a compliment. 
And it says, his eye, the Lord's eyes were upon him. That's not necessarily a compliment. Right. It's like God saying, I'm watching what you're doing, right? right? Yeah. So he goes and he establishes this, this city of Babel, which is the Babylonian Empire. It's, it's translated both Babel and Babylon. Mm -hmm. And that Babel is where they start to build the Tower of Babel, all right? Skip from there, because now we're, we're, we got, this, that's the foundation of the Babylonian Empire. But what we're going to go now is into the book of Daniel. Right. Okay? Because here's where we begin to see what is, has been established. If you know, if I, mean, I, I pray that you do, uh, that in the time of the Babylonian captivity, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And he, at the, basically because God the Father caused it, dragged Nebuchadnezzar and his armies down on Jerusalem and on Judah because of the disobedience of the people. Okay? okay. Read the book of Jeremiah uh, and, and see that whole account. And he carried, he, he, they destroyed the temple, and then they carried off the, ca the Jews captive back to Babylon. All right. Okay? Mm -hmm. This history is important, okay? So you get an understanding of where we are spiritually and where the church is, where Christianity is today. And what happens is there are, are the, the young men who found favor. They're Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Mm -hmm. In the court of Nebuchadnezzar. But in the second chapter of Daniel, it talks about the fact that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And his wise men could not interpret the dream. By the way, they were working under a handicap because Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't even tell them what the dream was. That's right. He said, you tell me, give me an interpretation of this dream. And they said, okay, what was the dream? And they said, no, no, no. <laughs> so uh, there. That's a real test. That's a real test. And there were none among his wise men that could do that. But God spoke to Daniel yes. and gave Daniel wisdom and an interpretation of the dream. This is in the second chapter of Daniel. So we're going to go through this line by line, but you, you need to go visit this, all right? Mm -hmm. Because the dream was that Nebuchadnezzar saw a statue with a golden head. And, and anyhow, when you get into this, you see that the interpretation that God gives Daniel to pass on to Nebuchadnezzar is it represents four kingdoms mm -hmm. that will oversee and rule the world from that time till the end of time, all right? The four kingdoms were the kingdom then of Babylon, which was followed by the, king, by the empire of Persia, which was followed by Greece, which was followed by Rome. So there's four kingdoms here, right? But you have to take note of the fact there's only one statue. Right. I think, you know, most Bible students or commentators kind of separate these and say, you know, okay, well, let's look at this kingdom, let's look at this kingdom. But the fact is, the Bible presents them as unified. Mm. Okay? The mm. kingdoms are in one statue. Right. And I, that's good because I believe there's a morphing mm. between those. Mm. And what becomes important is there's basically only one kingdom that's represented by those four. Okay? The one kingdom is the world system. And that world system, it says in the New Testament, in the book of James, James 5, 19, that the, this, this present world is in the power of the evil one. Yes. Okay. By the way, the word Babylon, the word Babel, is a Hebrew word for confusion. Yes. Okay. Remember the confusion, and remember how Nebuchadnezzar, in the book of Daniel, he's the head, right? The golden head. Winds up eating grass like an animal out in the fields yes. when God humbles him, right? What it says in Daniel 4 is that immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. And where was that? What chapter was that? That's Daniel 4, verse 33 is what I read, right? So here you have this man who is a, all the glory, and that's what it says, all the glory and all the power. Of this world system resided in him. Mm -hmm. And now here he is living like an animal. Now I'm going to jump ahead to the fourth kingdom, which is Rome. because, And we're going to deal with these through, right? But Rome, the final empire or kingdom, mm -hmm. is unique 
in that, and let me read to you what it says in, the, in Daniel 2. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. Okay? Now the stone is referred to... Give the verses there. That's, that's Daniel 2, verses 44 and 45. All right? The stone that's referred to didn't come from the work of man's hands. It says it was cut without hands, right? And it destroys all of those kingdoms. Right. Hmm. And it says that this kingdom, that kingdom, right, will never be destroyed. That was the kingdom controlling the world when Jesus came into the flesh was this statue. But when Jesus came, who is the rock, the rock of our salvation, Jesus came saying, the time is fulfilled and the gospel of God is at hand. Mm -hmm. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark 1.15, the kingdom is at hand. So while Rome was in power, the kingdom of God came into the world. Okay. Now the thing is, it says that God's kingdom will never be destroyed. But you know what? It's harder to see God's kingdom right now than it is to see the kingdom yes, of Rome. Yes, that's true. That's but that's what we're going to talk about. Because, you know, it's while Jesus came and is coming, mm -hmm. the kingdom of Rome is, but will not be. Okay? So it's existing now. Yes. But the kingdom of Rome is the one that will be destroyed yes. at the end. Rome is just another iteration, another manifestation of Babylon. Yes. They're all part of the same statue. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, a very, a very famous, I was going to say book, but it's actually a volume of books, uh, written by Edward Gibbon, was The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. which was written in the 1700s. Okay? Very, very famous historically. I don't think our world is much into history anymore. So he talks about the, basically the fall of the Roman Empire. He was a very intelligent guy, but I think he missed it entirely. Because in fact, the Roman Empire never fell. No. <laughs> now, I've heard somebody say, and I think they said it very wisely, that, that a, a country, a kingdom, an empire is defined by language, borders, and culture. Okay. Now, the context of that was, well, what's happening in the world around us if you look at Europe, uh, the borders are, are fuzzy, right? Um, Alice and I have spent a lot of time traveling through Europe in, in our ministry, and it's interesting that you, once you get into Europe, mm -hmm. there are no border stops. No, there isn't. Um, you know, not throughout the European common market. You just, you don't even know, half the time, the only way you know that you've crossed from one country to another is you get a message on your cell phone that the, the carrier has changed, all right? And the concern here in the United States is that, you know, are there, are there borders? Mm -hmm. in, in theory, there are borders, but they seem to be very vaporous, all right? And language? Well, mm -hmm. America used to be a, a mono, well, you know, there was one language. Right. Most things today in the United States are bilingual, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, I was reading an article in the news just recently where they were saying in some school districts, the vast majority of children that are in these classes are English is a second language, right? If, if at all, and in their homes, English is barely spoken in many of the homes, right? So, when did the Roman Empire fall? Borders, language, culture? They didn't. Uh, exactly. Borders, language, and culture, they did not. Because the language of the Roman Empire, Latin, is still spoken today. Yes. Now, I, I think you should be getting a clue that I'm talking about, that during the time of Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, which is the major transition in the early church, okay, where it goes. Remember I, I talked about the saying, Christianity started in Jerusalem as a fellowship. In Greece it became a philosophy. In Rome it became a culture. 
Right. Okay. The, the Rome of Constantine's time had a very distinct language. Yes. The, the costumes of the officials. Mm -hmm. Well, the Roman Catholic Church has carried all of those. All right. The things that you see, the, the, the dress, the language, that all comes from the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. I mean, Latin, the language of Rome, is still spoken today. Now, obviously, it's diminished to a great deal because when I grew up as a kid, I was, I was an adult before Latin stopped That's being the only, the only language of the Catholic man, right. period. I mean, right. that didn't happen until after the Second Vatican Council mm -hmm. in the mid-60s, right? Mm -hmm. So, but that language still exists. The Roman Empire was big in the time of Constantine. The Roman Empire today is bigger. Yes, yes. The Roman Empire it's grown. No, it has grown. It spans the globe. Mm -hmm. The Roman Empire, the Catholic Church, is the only religion that has diplomatic relations That's around the world. That's true. That's true. You know, it, it's in the news recently that the United States is restoring diplomatic relations with uh, Cuba. Yeah. After all these years, a place where I've had the opportunity to go and minister. But that happened through the Pope. But the Catholic Church was the first one to reestablish diplomatic relations mm -hmm. with with Cuba. Right. Okay. Exactly. And there is a culture of religiosity. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to get into that because that's how Babylon has brought how it's affected Christianity. I want you to see that Rome is Babylon. Okay? When Peter wrote his first letter, and he sent greetings from himself and Mark and the church where he was, he calls that Babylon. But all the evidence is, and it has always been accepted in the, from the early church on, that he was in Rome at the time. So he's speaking Babylon, you know, allegorically. Mm. So even then in the early church, in that time they're calling Rome Babylon. In the end of time, all right, mm -hmm. Revelation 17, 4 says, And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her, her immorality. Revelation 17, 4. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's a, the distinction there is the wealth, the, the I don't even want to say prosperity, you know, the, the clothing. Mm -hmm. Gold because and precious metals. When you go on to a, a little bit in verse nine, nine of that same chapter, speaking of Babylon, it's where she is called the mother of harlots, says that the beast that carries her has seven heads, which are the seven mountains. Yeah, it's in verse mm -hmm. five. Yeah, it says that. Yeah. Okay, but remember what I said in the beginning. Babylon was built where? On the plains of Shinar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? Plains. That's not mountains. Right. Rome has always been known as the city of the seven hills. Right? I mean, throughout, his, historically, from before the beginning of Christianity on, Rome has been the city of the seven hills. Revelation 18 talks about the destruction of the city of Babylon and refers to Rome. Because while Babylon sits between two rivers, Rome is the one that sits by the great sea. It also says in there, come out from her, my, my, my okay. people from all over the world. Okay. What entity is based in Rome and worldwide? Only one. Only one. Now, yes. I am, I'm asking you, as I always have, you know, I'm not asking you to take my word for anything. I ask you to test everything that I say. But test it against the word of God. Yes. The, the purpose of the show is to search for true Christianity because we have strayed from that, okay? And the purpose of this is to find those things so we can go back. Christians are supposed to be radical. The root. Um, yeah, because everything I hear today, the term, the word radical is always, has a very negative connotation. Yes. You know, it's radical terrorists, radical Islamists, right? But radical comes from the same root word as radish. It means, that's what it means, root. Mm -hmm. And we want to get back to that place where we are in the teaching of Jesus Christ without the trappings of man's doctrines and traditions, 
okay, and cultures. So a lot of this may be challenging. If it's not challenging, it can't accomplish its purpose. If you're not confronted with what's, you know, what needs to be fixed. What needs to be changed. What needs to be changed, you, you, you don't do anything. Okay, I want to talk about the theology of Babylon. Okay, let me start when I already read this in verse in verse five. It says, "Upon her forehead, Revelation seventeen five. Upon her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. The mother is the one that gives life to something. Yes. So it is saying right that that the harlotry and harlotry." When God speaks of adultery in the Bible, yes, there is a natural adultery, but if we are the bride of Christ, he's talking about us cheating on Jesus. That's harlotry. This, the theology of Babylon can be summed up in four statements. Okay. Salvation by works. Yes. The centrality of the building. Mm -hmm. The authority of the builders and misdirected worship. Mm. That is the theology of Babylon. Okay? Remember, confusion reigns when you listen to two voices speaking at the same time. The theology of confusion was first preached in the garden yes. to the woman who was a willing listener. The serpent called God's word into question, calling it a lie. He said, the serpent said to Eve, who was the, only the woman at the time, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. Mm -hmm. That serpent was saying to the woman, If you disobey God, you'll be like him. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's a sermon straight from the heart of Satan. He believed that he could make himself like the Most High God. Isaiah 14, 14 is speaking allegorically of Satan when it says, I will make myself like the Most High God. Right? His dark heart was filled with a lie, and out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth spoke. The gospel of the enemy was then, always has been, and will be, to, it'll continue to be until Jesus returns, a gospel of works. You get to heaven by what you do, by what you do, not by what Jesus did. Right. One of the most scary, if that's the right word, verses in all scripture is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus says, many will come to me on that day, saying, Lord, Lord, look what I did. Look what I did. Look at my works. I, I cast out demons. I prophet. I did all that. And, and Jesus says to them, Depart from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. If you come into the presence at the, at the close of your life, and the first thing you want to say is, Hey, look at my works. You have never known him, and he has never known you. Ephesians 2. I'm going to read verses 6 through 9. And talking about God. And God raised us up with him, Jesus, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast." And that is where? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Okay. So, the idea that you can do something to earn your way into heaven is insane. Yes. It really is that simple. Whether it comes dressed in Babylonian robes or Persian splendor, through Greek philosophy, or through the Roman Empire, it is the grand lie. It proclaims that you don't need Jesus. That's what it does. It's an abomination. It does. The, the thing is, and I want to talk about this, is the centrality of the building. The centrality. You got The building is what's important. Well, if they're building the tower, if they're building the Tower of Babel. What was the purpose of the Tower of Babel? To reach heaven. To reach heaven. 
But if they build a tower and it reaches heaven, the only way to get there is through the building. Yes. <laughs> well, isn't that true? Yes, yes. So in, in the Babylonian theology, the building itself was central to yeah. salvation and to their theology. The tower would reach into heaven. So it would give access to those who would travel through it. Mm. You know, Alice and I had the opportunity in some of our travels. We were over in, in Pisa mm. in uh, Tuscany in Italy and went to see the Leaning Tower. Now, I was making, looking, going around looking at these massive cathedrals, not because I found them attractive, not because I wanted to do the tourist thing, mm. but because I found them horrific. Yes. The, the tower, and you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is nothing more than a bell tower. That's all it was. It was built to, to have a bell, the bell for the massive cathedral right next to it. Mm -hmm. right? But it took 200 years to build. The bell tower? The yes. bell tower, just the bell tower, took 200 years to build. It was built from 1173 to 1372. It's insane. It is insane. But what's really insane is who paid the billions of dollars in today's dollars mm. to build that thing? People who thought they were gaining favor with God by putting this into the building. Yes. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> well, it does it? That's what we're going to get into. I mean, now it is nothing more than a tourist attraction. Yes, it is. And, and that's that's to think of what went into that, the lives that went into that. 200 years, it's horrible. You know, back in the, in the 70s, in the mid 70s, when I first got saved, I was talking about salvation to an acquaintance of, of ours, a father of an, uh, a relative actually, and talking to him about salvation, because I want well, to know you, and we were very excited about salvation, I, mean, <laughs> I still am, hallelujah. So I, I'm trying to ask him about where he is with the Lord. And his only comments would be, well, I donated $3,000 to put stained glass windows in history. I, I donated money to buy bricks. His entire focus on his relationship with God was not about his relationship with God. It's about what he did for that church. Right. It was about the building. That is a deceit. Mm. That's an absolute deceit. A distraction. Um, I'm, I'm going to close on this because we'll run out of time again already. Wow. I've wanted the pastor's conferences. I've spoken to pastors around many, many places mm -hmm. and said, how many of you will go this Sunday and welcome people as they come in and say, welcome to the house of the Lord. This is one of the things that I'm talking about. That is a lie from the pits of hell. Yes. One that we need to change and we need to change it now. Okay. Just listen to these couple of verses. From Acts 7, I'm going to read 48 to 51. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? Yeah. You know, I'm going to pick this right up in our next program. And you don't want to miss that, because we're going to start getting into the really, really good stuff here right now. But we don't have time to do that. Father, I thank you that you are faithful. Father, I thank you that you are not a man that you should change. Father, I thank you that you have spoken through your word, that your son Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. May we come to that place, Lord, that the things that we have decided to change, we will repent of and get back to that place where we are led by your word. In Jesus' name. Well, till next time. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the deep and best for a world of lost sinners.